Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you sent Jesus on a mission. Wet with water, anointed with spirit, he came out of that Jordan Valley and took on the world and did a good job of it. Let us be of like spirit and mind. Coming out of the waters of baptism, let us take on this world for you and be people of grace and mercy, for that is what the world needs. Let us follow in his steps. In his name we pray. Amen. Most of the time when we gather for worship, we can fairly well predict what's going to happen. In the standard liturgy, there's not too many places where something can go terribly wrong. Not so when baptism is introduced into the picture. For some reason, we can sail through thousands of Holy Communions with no mishaps greater than the occasional floating wafer in the chalice or a few drops of wine on the rail. But add a baby, water, nervous parents, and a sibling or two, and you have the recipe for chaos or the potential thereof. Most parents are worried about little Bobby or Susie, in fact, that they might scream and ruin the holy tranquility of the day. My concerns go in totally other directions. I've had babies throw up on me in baptisms and had to wear that the rest of the service because it's considered impolite to wash your stole in the font. I've had diapers leak on me, which occasioned me to leave worship. Again, not considered real good to wash up in the font. And yes, there have been the occasional screamers, although not many. Some siblings try to get in on the act. A member of St. Mark's recently told me that when his youngest was getting baptized, his sister, a toddler, looked up at the pastor, Pastor Setzer, and said, Hey, mister, what you doing? However, my memories of baptismal mistakes go back to the days in Ohio when I went to take a baby from his mother. And the font was in the middle of the sanctuary. And his mother that day was wearing this wonderfully beautiful wraparound dress. And I just happened to get my hand inside that dress. And when I went to take the baby, things started to really go badly for a moment. We caught it before things got too far, and rather than being embarrassed, we all just had a good laugh right there in the middle of the sanctuary. Yeah, baptism is risky business. But apart from the apparent mishaps that can occur, do we understand how risky the business of baptism really is? Let's take a look. From the evidence in Matthew's story of the good news, it's pretty clear that Jesus' public ministry began following his baptism. He was baptized by John in the Jordan. The Spirit descends. God affirms this event with those great words, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The next chapter, Jesus is wrestling and taking on Satan and beating him. And then he goes and proclaims this message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The disciples are called, the ball's rolling. Jesus' baptism officially launched his ministry. In his baptism, he identifies with us so we can better identify with him. In his baptism, we are reminded that he received the power of the Holy Spirit, and so do we. Jesus' baptism reminds us that God placed the divine seal of approval on him, and God also places it on us. With oil we trace on a child or adult's forehead the sign of the cross and say, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. And then something seems to happen. It seems that we kind of forget about the baptism. It was beautiful, it was nice, but it's done now, on to other things. We almost seem to treat baptism as a one-time event, not viewing it as the life process that it really is. Baptism is not an end. It is 
a beginning. It is not fireproofing little Johnny or Mary for eternity, whereby now you can just sit back, take it easy until Gabriel blows his horn. It is a commissioning service whereby we are called and sent in to a service of lifetime. Some will argue, well, but infants can't serve. Of course they can't. But the years of living under the sign and seal of the Spirit as an infant and a toddler and a young person is where we train these young shoots how to grow up. That's why not only parents and godparents need to take these baptismal promises seriously, but an entire congregation responds in this. This is a group effort. It takes an entire family of faith to raise up a child in Christ. Remember the promises. Bring the baptized to the Word of God and the Holy Supper. Teach them the Lord Prayer, the Creed, the Ten Commandments. Nurture them in faith and prayer. Put the Holy Scriptures in their hands. Why? Well, page 228 continues. So that they may learn to trust God, proclaim Christ through word and deed, care for others and for the world God has made, and work for justice and peace. Do we really get the depth of those promises? Do we understand the life to which baptism calls us? If we did, I think we might be a little more thoughtful about this thing. Baptism is initiation into a community of faith, a living body of Christ in the world, a fellowship of suffering and of taking on the suffering of others. And grace, initiation to lives of service. Baptism is not about promises of success or greatness, not lives of just easily strolling hand in hand with Jesus down some primrose path. To live out the reality of one's baptism is to take up a cross and follow Jesus. That's what Isaiah was talking about 700 years before Jesus came on the scene. The old prophet in the text of today is talking about the Lord's anointing. Baptism is an anointing. Notice how closely Isaiah's words are to Matthew. Isaiah says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. Matthew has God saying, Here is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. It's the same thing. And notice the life of the anointed, the servant. The beloved is called to. In Isaiah, he says, he will bring forth justice to the nation. He will faithfully bring justice, light to the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, bring prisoners out of dungeon, from prison those who sit in darkness. What else did Jesus do but that? He didn't proclaim a gospel of high cotton and easy times. He did in the Sermon Amount on the mount, talk about the blessed of God. He called them poor in spirit, mourners, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for what is right, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, and the persecuted. He talked about them being salt and light. He says, as we do in our service of baptism, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So how do we live out our baptisms? We do it first by acknowledging that this is a process. It's not an end in itself. Someone once introducing themselves to Maya Angelou said, oh, by the way, I'm a Christian. And Maya said, really, already? She said, I thought that took a lifetime. And it does. None of us has yet arrived, we're still being formed and will continue to be formed as long as we live in this earth. And baptism is to be lived out in the world, in the community. It's, it's not an act for private consolation. It's not about the individual. It exists for the glory of God through which individuals serve God. When Jesus was baptized by the Spirit, He was sent. So are we. Sent to do what? 
Well, for starters, that Sermon on the Mount stuff. We're also anointed to do what Isaiah said, work for justice in the world, setting things right. That's righteousness, bringing the light of God's love to the world, opening the eyes of those who will not see the truth, liberating and freeing them up, and releasing anyone who is captive. And when we baptize infants or adults, we put them on a path of service. You see, this place is not a shelter from the world. This is a place where you're trained to go out into the world. Let's face it, baptism is risky business. Baptism, when done correctly, puts a huge burden on us. Jesus put it this way, take up your cross and follow me. Those who have been sealed with the cross must bear the cross. And know it or not, this is the life we have been called to as followers of Jesus. It's risky business because it puts us counterculturally with the world. To live this out properly is going to put us in situations we never dreamed we'd be in, but at points where the inhabitants of this world are most in pain and we can help take it away. Jesus says, let your light so shine, but I'm afraid sometimes it just flickers. We had a family friend, long deceased, by a man by the name of Sam, who ran a huge plumbing company in Miami. Sam was active in my home church when I was growing up. He served everywhere. Council committees, he ran a youth program, he taught Sunday school, you name it, Sam did it. And one day, for no particular reason, Sam wore a cross pinned to his lapel, and he ran into a contractor he had known for years. And upon seeing the cross, the man said, Sam, I didn't know you were a Christian. And Sam said that was the most devastating thing anyone could have ever said to him. He said, I've known that man my entire working life. I've known him for over 30 years. And he didn't know I was a Christian. I'm shamed by that, he said. Well, it was also a life-changing event for Sam because you never saw him without his cross from then on, and he never missed a chance to tell somebody about Christ or to ask them to come to worship. We walk through life with damp heads, sealed with the Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever, and most people don't know it. But they need to know it. We need to live out our baptisms And the world needs what we can offer them. I know it's risky business, this baptism stuff. Live it properly and you could end up on wood. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is near. And each time we live out our baptismal promises in the world, the kingdom draws a little nearer. Amen.